All right, welcome back everybody. I hope everyone's having a good week. I just want to do a quick video and check in, see how everyone's doing. Uh, it's been a busy week. I mean, just this last Monday morning, it feels like it's been a long time, but just this last Monday morning, I posted my most recent upload and it was the often ignored truth about bonds. And in this video, I went over and I explained, I wasn't trying to advocate for bonds or say that everybody needs them in their portfolio. I just wanted to create a little bit more awareness about the role that they play. And I think it's especially useful in weeks like this week that we've been having. If I look at this, the S&P 500 has gone down about 1.7% in the past five market days. So it's gone down quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that. I know a lot of people are new to the stock market. They're entering in and now they're in the red. And so I'm going to be going over that and just talking about a few things that you might want to look at. Other things is I've had maybe over 200 comments on this past video. I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds as well as probably a couple dozen emails. And so in this video, what I wanted to do for the main part of it was just go through, pick a few of the questions that I thought were interesting and answer those. So I'll be doing that for the majority of the video. And then there was one news item I'm going to hit on on the end, which was Carl Icahn suing Occidental Petroleum. That's one of my holdings. Uh, he's a shareholder of the company as well as me. He owns a little bit more of it. But he's suing because he doesn't like this deal that Warren Buffett's doing and he doesn't like the situation. I just wanted to mention that at the end of the video. I'll go over it. All right. So first, let's jump into this week and see how things are going. My portfolio is down 1.75%. That's a little bit more than the S&P 500, mostly because real estate and utilities have been hit pretty hard this week. Um, I mean, I, I've been through this so many times. Real estate has so much money go in and out of it all the time that it gets a little old. It just... Money flows into it, money flows out of it. And in the meantime, the important thing is whether these companies are doing well, whether they continue to pay their dividends. And that's really what matters. If I look at this from week to week, and I'm always concerned about the market going down, or I'm happy when the market goes up, that's not how I do this portfolio. I've said over and over again that I do not really care or focus about the capital appreciation. This top line, market gains, is capital appreciation the bottom line is earned dividends. So in the past month, I've earned $122 in dividends. That's the past 30 days. Market gains are down $759. Now, a lot of people say, well, how can you not care about capital appreciation, right? Isn't that a big part of the portfolio? Sure, I think capital appreciation will eventually follow the level of income a portfolio puts out. So if I continually, if I go to my chart here, I'm tracking my dividends here. If I continually increase the amount that my portfolio pays out, I believe there will be a trend of capital appreciation that follows that. But I think the capital appreciation is a lot more jagged than this, this line of just increasing my dividend payments. And the reason why is because if you look at the news, I mean, every little thing that happens, Trump talking about tariffing Mexico or, or the issues with the trade war with China or all these different things going on, every little thing seems to affect the market and scare people one direction or the other. Now, it's hard to keep track of. And frankly, I don't think you should try to keep track of all the little changes in the market. But I do think that this is a good thing for people entering the market that are brand new to it. And I know that's a little bit counterintuitive because if you just enter the market and you see yourself losing money right at the start, you might be thinking, how is that possibly a good thing? But I think it is. And the reason why, it gives you a good gauge of your risk tolerance. It's the same type of thing where you can read about surfing, you know, you can read about that in textbooks all day, but you do not experience it until you actually go out on the waves. And that's what it's like feeling the market go down a little bit. This dip 1.7% isn't a whole lot. The market could go down 10% or 20%. And so what you have to do is you have to look at your portfolio, see how your portfolio did with this downturn and adjust your risk based on that. So if you look at this portfolio and you go, wow, this went down a lot, you know, a lot more than I'm comfortable with for this type of downturn, that means you might want to bump up this section right here, this section that's in the green. If this downturn was a little bit more than you're expecting, or it makes you uncomfortable, you're not happy with it, that type of thing, you might be better suited bumping bonds up to 40% or 30%, right? Adjusting your risk based off of what's going on with the market. And so a lot of people, everybody has different risk tolerances. If you were fine with this and this doesn't bother you at all and you're just buying more shares right now as it's going down and you're excited about it, then you might want to lower your amount of bonds. So it just depends on the person, depends on what you're doing. My portfolio went down 1.75% in the past week. If I go to the month view, it's down 
7%, so a little bit less for the overall month. If I go to the month of the S&P 500, it's down 4.8%. So even though my portfolio went down a little bit more than the S&P 500 just this week, for the month view, it went down less than half as much. So it's still a lot more conservative than the S&P 500 over a little bit longer period of time. But regardless, I really do think if you're just getting in the market, now's the time to figure out your risk tolerance. Figure it out, guys. If you have a lower risk tolerance, if you're going, wow, I am stressing about the amount of money I'm losing already, and you just entered the market and you only have a couple thousand dollars in it, imagine if you have $100,000 and you lose 5,000 in a day or 10,000 in a day, this is the time to figure out your risk tolerance. Adjust it. If you have bonds, you can control risk a little bit by upping the amount of bonds you have. You can control risk by lowering the amount of the, the things that are really volatile. You have tech over here that went down 7%. Industrials went down 6%. The bonds are the, the ones that you probably can adjust risk the most by. I just think it's a good time to do that. We'll see where the market goes. One thing I have been thinking about doing in my bonds pie, I have these different holdings and I think that they're all great. I really like LQD. Um, but I've been thinking about adding in another one called BNDX, and that it's Vanguard's total international bond market ETF. And the reason why is I read a article about how this is a currency hedge, and it's a really good international hedge against the US currency or inflation or anything like that that happens, as well as it pays a decent yield, 3%, and it's heavily diversified. It has a lot of assets under management, so it's really liquid. And Vanguard always has a low expense ratio. So I've been considering adding this one to my bonds pie, but I haven't made up my mind on that. It's just something I'm looking into. Other changes to my portfolio I will mention because I know a lot of people are following my portfolio. You'll notice some of the actual on target are a little bit adjusted. So I started off with real estate when I only had like, well, I say only, I mean, it's all relative. But when I had like five or 10,000, I started off with 33% real estate. And as I've been gaining more and more money, I've been slowly lowering my exposure to real estate. What I did was I put it so that the target's at 25%, and then I added in percentages to all these ones to adjust for it. And I just want to, I was really overexposed. You know, I had a really large amount of real estate, and I want to balance out the portfolio a little bit more so that I have these other sectors a little bit more exposure to these other sectors. So uh, other than those changes to portfolio, um, not too much has gone on. I mean, with this type of week, yeah, we went down. We'll see what happens. Nobody can see the future with it. The big thing I pay attention to, like I said, is this income. I want this to continue to go up. The, the thing that concerns me is when companies cut their dividends. That's what I hate to see. I don't really care to see. This doesn't bother me. In fact, if this happens and companies are doing great and they're not cutting their dividends, that's great. We get a better deal on the companies we're buying. But if this happens and it's an actual indicator of something serious going on, and companies cut their dividends, they're struggling to survive, that's when things actually become a problem, right? So right now, I'm not really too concerned about this. But anyway, let's move on to some questions. Alrighty, so you can write in. It's uh, The email is josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com, josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. And I'll throw up the first question. It's from Amelia. Uh, she says, as a new investor, being able to get some dividends rolling in and starting out is a little rough, especially when the market is on a decline. Is increasing our contributions to our portfolio the only way to offset that loss or do we ride the wave and trust that our investments will pull us through? If we continually contribute normally, whether it's weekly, monthly, etc. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it is dividend investing starting off is rough to begin with because your dividends are so small to begin with. There's not a whole lot of compounding that happens right at the start. And it takes a lot to get the ball rolling. Now, as far as the question part of it, where, they, where she says, is increasing our contributions to our portfolio the only way to offset the loss? That's one way, that's not the only way. If you're concerned about the market going down this past week, it's gone down 1.7%. If we actually, let me go over to a graph here. So if I go to the one month, in the past month, it's gone down about 4.8%. If we zoom out to six months, past six months, it's gone down just 0.26%. Then if we go year to date, the market is up 10.8%, almost 11%. Now, along this timeline, it totally depends on where you just started investing. So if you started investing along here, you've made money. If you started investing along here, you've lost money. And you can't really 
do anything to control for that. A lot of that is just luck of when you start investing. Most of the companies in my portfolio are S&P 500 blue chip companies, so they're going to follow the S&P 500 pretty closely. Now, as far as mitigating the losses or what to do in the downturns, if you bought solid companies that you're really comfortable with owning for the next 10 or 20 years, you can't be looking at a one month time period. You have to understand that these companies, they're prepared to go through recessions and downturns. They're prepared for that and they've done it before. Most of the companies I own, they went through 2009, the worst financial recession we've ever had, and they survived it. And so there's no reason to suggest they won't be able to survive the next one. It's whether you can survive it is the real question. I think most of the companies I own will probably do okay. Some of them might fall off, but a lot of them will do okay. And so it's whether you can survive the downturn and keep invested during that time. One thing you can do, you can dollar cost average in, like you're saying, keep investing during a downturn. But I really think it's a time to just pick your risk tolerance. You have to figure out your risk tolerance. If this is a lot to handle, like this past week or the past few weeks of it going down 4%, again, if we look at this graph, year to date, it's up 11%. There's nothing to stop this market from going down 11%. So if you look at it and you would be destroyed if it went down 11%, increase the amount of fixed income you have. Increase the amount of bonds that you have buy investor grade bonds, treasury bonds, and you know, international bonds and those type of things to help help soften those blows. So you can just pick a, a more conservative portfolio allocation. There's nothing wrong with that if you feel more comfortable with that. Okay, so the next question is a good one. It says, hi, Joseph, I would like to know where M1 Finance gets its income if it's not from transactions. I assume some of it is from the cash on the account that is below $10. I like your conservative, sensible approach to investing. Thank you. Okay, so how does M1 make money, right? They're a free broker. They don't charge anything for transactions and there's no like hidden fees anywhere either. And that was one of the biggest questions I had when I signed up for M1 Finance is how on earth they made money. And I did a lot of research on it and there is a really sensible answer to it. So one thing is most even traditional brokers, they don't make most of their money on transaction fees. They make maybe like from 30, you know, 20 to 40% of it on transaction fees. Now, those transaction fees are going down and down because brokers like M1 are pushing the whole industry to reduce the amount of transaction fees they're charging. But where they do make their money, there's lots of ways that brokers monetize your money. The cash on the account is one way. I don't think M1 makes particularly a lot of money that way because anything over $10 can be invested. So I don't think they have tons of money sitting as cash. But that's definitely one way that they make money. Another way is called lending shares, which... There's other brokers that allow for short selling. When M1 Finance lends your shares to short sellers, they charge interest on that. And M1 Finance pockets the interest that they charge. That helps pay for M1 Finance. So you don't get the interest on your lended shares. M1 Finance does. They monetize your shares that way. It doesn't affect you all though. Like lending shares is a totally common practice that every broker virtually does. So that's one way to make money is lending shares. Another is cash on account. Another is selling order flows. They make money that way as well. Another one is M1 Finance has M1 Borrow, which is a way that you can get margin on your account and you pay an interest fee on that. It's like a 4.25% interest on margin. So that's like a fifth way they make money. And then another way that they're going to make money is they're coming out with M1 Spend, which is their banking functionality. And then they have a premium version coming out that's a yearly membership that gives you a bunch of perks, high yield savings account or high yield checking account, all these different things. And that's called M1 plus. And that's going to be like, I don't know, it's like 50 or hundred bucks a year or something like that to get all these extra perks. They're not changing the price of the whole base uh, investing system. So that will always be free, but they have, I mean, right there, that's like five or six different ways that they can monetize. So they have a lot of ways of making money. Fees aren't one of them um, that they want to pursue. And I think the whole industry is going to move more towards that way. A lot of, uh, Traditional brokers that were charging fees are drastically reducing them. Okay, so the next question is from Brad. He says, can you please explain in a video why companies in S&P 500, especially like Amazon, do not pay dividends? So this is, a, this is kind of a question about why companies return value to shareholders in different ways. There's different ways companies can return value to their shareholders. They can either give part of the cash flow that they're generating through dividends, or they can try to increase their overall company's growth and standing and market capitalization through expansion. Now, 
there's some companies that I think it's great they pay dividends. Those are the ones I invest in. They're companies that have excess amount of cash flow, more than necessary to reinvest in themselves and expand. And what they do with that excess cash flow is they return value to their shareholders by dispersing some of that cash flow to the investors, to us. Those are dividends. Now, there's other companies like Amazon. And Amazon has such a smart team. They have so many smart people working there and they're expanding into so many different industries all at once that they need 100% of their cash to be able to fuel that growth. And they're thinking, well, we don't need to return value to shareholders through cash because we can return value to shareholders by rapidly expanding into many, as many different industries as we can. And that's the goal behind it. It's a different strategy. They're, they're, they're both successful. There's some people that do growth companies and there can be a lot of success that way. There's people that do dividend strategy and there can be a lot of success that way. There's different benefits and pros and cons to each of them, but you have to look at what's the best way a company can return value to its shareholder. For some companies that's paying dividends, for some it's growing. Amazon is one of the companies that has decided it can return more value to its shareholders by reinvesting in itself and growing rather than sharing some of its cash that it generates. Okay, so I'll do one more question. I have another like six lined up, but this could go on for another hour if I let it. So I'll answer the others in another video. Uh, this last one's from Dylan. He says, doesn't growth of a stock and trend matter? You always talk about how you don't care about capital appreciation, but if a stock takes a 15 to 20% loss in a year and your dividend is two to 3%, doesn't it kind of take away from your return on investment? Curious on your take on this. Thanks, man. All right, Dylan, so that's a good question. I have said before, I, it's not that I don't care about capital appreciation. It's that I don't use it as the gauge of how my portfolio is doing. Because capital appreciation, I mean, it's decided on investor sentiment. At least in the short term, investor sentiment and emotion plays a huge role on capital appreciation. Investors just moving their money in and out of a company. Investors decide capital appreciation. The company decides the dividend. Do you see the difference there? Investors and external force are deciding the capital of the company, while internally the company itself is deciding the dividend. So what I'm doing is saying I'd rather focus on the thing that the company is actually deciding. They're the ones that have the balance sheet. They're the ones that are deciding how much of a dividend they pay. They don't decide how much their company is worth by capital appreciation. That's investors. I think investors are much more finicky and much, much more emotional than the executive team at these different companies that stew over the balance sheets. So what I'm saying is that I focus on the balance sheets. I focus on the dividends that are a reflection of that. Now, we can go to your example specifically. If a company loses 20% of its value and is paying like a 3% dividend, what does that do to the dividend yield? When a company goes down in value, but it's paying a, you know, it was paying a 3% dividend, that yield increases. And what happens when a company, a good company pays a high dividend? That attracts more investors. And when more investors buy into a company, that drives up the price of the share, which increases the capital appreciation. So dividends do increase the capital appreciation over time. If a company is able to sustainably increase a dividend over time, the capital appreciation will follow because investors, they seek yield, they wanna find yield. And when companies are able to provide that, investors will follow. Now, there's some companies that will have a high yield and investors still go, no way I'm going to put my money in that. You know, you might have GameStop as an example. And the reason that happens is because there's things actually going wrong with the company. There's actually decaying fundamentals in the company. And that will happen whether you have capital appreciation focus or not. So the people that are just growth investors, they're going to have some companies that fall because the fundamentals decay. So there's nothing you can do about that. But my strategy is not to focus on the whims of the investors. It's to focus on the actual companies, the things that are decided internally and see how their fundamentals are doing. Uh, I think if a company is able to continually increase its dividend payment year over year and keep that as a fundamental strength of the company, capital appreciation will follow because investors will follow that increasing yield. So that's the basic premise of this investing strategy. So that's all the questions I'll do. Let's uh, talk about the last thing, which is the news. I, I had a touch on this news story, so I thought it was pretty great. This is a follow-up to the whole Occidental Petroleum buying Anadarko deal. I talked about this like a week or two ago, about how Occidental Petroleum is buying another company around the same size of them called Anadarko. And in order to make the deal work, they had to find outside funding, and they found it with Warren Buffett. 
And Warren Buffett made out a wonderful deal for himself where he got preferred shares and a higher dividend yield than the common shareholder. And the consensus on this was that the common shareholder of Occidental got kind of screwed in the deal. They were, they got the bad end of the deal. And that showed, I mean, the stock went down like 40%. So I'm way down on it. Luckily, it's a very small holding of mine. Now, this guy right here um, is Carl Icahn. He's worth about $17 billion. He's an active investor. And what I didn't know is that he is a shareholder in Occidental. So he disclosed that he holds $1.6 billion of Occidental shares, nearly 5% of the company. He's not happy about this deal at all. He calls it hugely overpriced. He's suing Occidental. You know, he's trying to get paperwork and trying to figure out what's going on because he thinks that this deal is fundamentally misguided. It's the way that he put it. And then he took a big jab at the leadership saying, quote, a 90 minute deal negotiation with one of history's canniest investors. That means like most shrewd investors is no place to gain merger and acquisition experience, at least if you care about protecting your stockholders. He's talking about their negotiation with Warren Buffett. He pretty much says that Warren Buffett took advantage of them because they're green. They don't know what they're doing. And Warren Buffett is a super experienced with this, which is kind of what happened. Warren Buffett really got a great deal with this. Uh, the common shareholder did not get a great deal with this. And neither did Mr. Icon, who owns $1.6 billion. So he's furious about it. I think he's going to try to stir things up and, you know, he's obviously doing a lawsuit. I don't think he's going to be successful at stopping this deal, though. I think it's going to continue to go through. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But I thought it was interesting to mention that. Anyway, well, I hope that you guys have a good weekend. I will see you next time.